So good evening, everyone. As uh, Shai said, I'm Shirley Jameson, and we've got Tony on the left and Andrea in the center. And uh, we'll be interacting with you, hopefully, right through the whole of the session. So at this point, I'm going to stop and hand over to Tony, because I think he's got something to ask you. Great. Well, hi, I'm Tony. I'm, I've got the best job in the world, because uh, while Shai thinks a lot about this stuff, I get the chance to do it, and do it with the best academics in the world and the brightest students in the world. And one of the great things about this job is you never know what's going to walk through the door tomorrow. And a lot of it can change this world in ways that uh, are quite phenomenal. So we've got Shirley and Andrea with me tonight. And uh, tonight's going to be an exciting journey for me. Maybe not for you, but for me, because they've changed a few of the slides on me, so I'm not quite... I've had about as much knowledge as you have of what's coming next. In the, in the presentation. But what, a, and what we're going to do is take you on a sort of an interesting journey, and it's going to take us through money, it's going to take us through sex, and it's going to take us through philosophy. So uh, hmm. hang on to the end, and uh, you might find some interesting stuff comes out of it. Okay. But the first thing I want to ask you all here is, is what are we here for as a university? The university has a mission statement. Has anybody here read it? That's good. No one can cheat. So what do you think we're here for? What's the university here to do? Any, uh, any suggestions? Research. Yeah. Research. Very good. Network. Network. Advanced Teaching. Knowledge. Advanced knowledge. Those are all the things you might expect of a university. Let's see what the university actually says its mission is. It's actually here to benefit society is a surprising one and research and teaching and all the rest of it is is the tools it uses to do that and it uses the world's best people in the process so I think that's why for this university the sort of activity the great turnout we've got here tonight is very important because it's not just about doing the research and, and the teaching and the learning it's about what you do with it afterwards that helps uh, make a difference to society and so that's uh, how we actually do that is going to be one of the things we're going to cover tonight. Now, from the university, here you find it's very different from many other universities. One of the first things this university does is it seeks to recruit the best academics and the best students in the world. And if you've recruited the best person in a field, who's going to second guess them on what it's the best thing for them to be doing with their time. What's the best research topic? And so here the philosophy is you recruit the best in the world and you let them get on with whatever they want to do. It's up to them to decide. It, it has some problems. It creates what I call creative chaos because there's no organisation, there's no sort of uh, direction, there's no um, control as the university. And what we create on is this thing on the left-hand side, which is a rainforest. A lot of people in this field want to make a plantation on the right where everything is neat and tidy so it's easy to organise. All the trees are labelled, they're all the same height and, and blend. But what we, we get a chance to do here, the rainforest produces suddenly, serendipitously, some superb blooms or fruits that we get the chance to harvest and enjoy. But one of the big things is, is when we do this process, it is very much about nurturing it, not trying to sort of go in with the chainsaws and shovels and, and make it all look neat and tidy like on the right. And that's an important part of the way that we work here. So we give people the freedom to do what they want to do. There is issues over IP. In the UK, the intellectual property that's created belongs to the employer. But because we have very complex situations here, because it's the employer of the university or the college, uh, etc., we tend to take a fairly sort of uh, free approach to doing this because the objective is to make that difference at the end of the day. And that's what we set out to do. So most of you hopefully will recognize one of our famous alumni, Isaac Newton, who was here in the 17th century. And, um, Contrary to what people believe, he did not discover gravity. But he did, however, invent the cat flap. I don't know if you realize that or not. But that's not the reason for putting him up this evening. 
Uh, I'd like you, if you could, somebody in this audience must have a two pound coin in their pocket. If anybody knows the reason I'm asking, I'd rather that they didn't say. Could somebody please produce a two pound coin? And I'm looking for a very particular two pound coin. And I'll let you know when you found it. I'm not looking for the Mary Rose two pound coin, and I'm not looking for the Guy Fox two pound coin. So if you've got one of those, I'm not interested. When somebody's got one, shout out, please. Has somebody got a two pound coin? I hope so. You've got one. Okay, somebody in the front has got one. Let's hope he's got the right one. Could you tell me what's written on the side of the two pound coin? Did you hear what he said? It says on the side of that two pound coin, standing on the shoulders of giants. A lot of people don't realize there's things written on the side of a two pound coin. And there's a reason that he said this, and it's something that we want to remember this evening as we're going through our presentation, is that what he said in a letter to Robert Hooke, who, as you know, he was in Serbia on contention with over you know, the, the um, discoveries that they're making, is that if I'd seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Now, you might think sort of this is all a modern fashion, sort of uh, universities getting involved with commercializing and business. But our first spin out from the university was 1534, and it's Cambridge University Press. The, the document you see on the left there is actually the spin out uh, contract signed by Henry VIII to create Cambridge University Press. It wasn't that good at the start, it took it 50 years, 1584, before it got its first product to market. <laughs> and I think uh, these days no venture capital would stay around for a fraction of that. But it is, it, has, it did change the world by bringing the scholarship to the world. And today, that's a $250 million global business based here in Cambridge, 50 offices around the world, which, which translate the, translates the academic knowledge into publications which people can use. The other one which they keep quiet about is our second spin-out was Harvard University. <laughs> and if you go into the chapel in Emmanuel College, you'll see in the corner there, there is a, by the door, there's a plaque which has been erected by the people of uh, Harvard University recognising um, John Harvard, who came from Emmanuel and set up the college. And at the same time, in recognition of that, they changed the name of, from Newtown to Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we think that the spin is doing rather well. Yeah. And if you look at that long history of innovation, it's gone on. Um, Darwin's grandson created a company which supplied scientific instruments to the university and then to the scientific community in, in the uh, 1890s. And uh, that went on to become Cambridge Instruments, which developed things like the electron, scanning electron microscope. And it had a spin-out uh, about six years later. One of its employees set up a company called Pi, which became Pi Communications, one of the pioneers in radio communications. And that then went on to become part of Philips in, in Cambridge. So we have this long history. And one of the good examples of it is, um, is our computer labs. If you go in there, you'll see just inside the door on the right is this big wooden uh, tower with all of the companies which have come out of... Uh, out of computer labs. And that really builds on a history going back to people like uh, Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace in Victorian times who sort of set out the basic principles of computing and tried to do it mechanically. If you go to the Science Museum, there's a mechanical Babbage machine down there that, you can, that someone has actually built now, going through the very famous Alan Turing, um, who was here. And that really sort of created the foundations of computing in the world. So, illustrates the way that this university and the people within it, the, those academics, are really changing the world, leading through to what we have here today. And here are some examples of it again. EDSAC was the first sort of electronic computer that was uh, created here. It used vacuum tubes. Anyone remember vacuum tubes? They're quite popular still in audio equipment. 
And if you tried to build one of these out of vacuum tubes, it would never work because the filaments would burn out. You couldn't replace the, the vacuum tubes fast enough for filaments burning out to actually make it work. But that, was, that started off, we then went on into ARM and the early, big role in the early computer industry here with the BBC Micro and, uh, and Sinclair and uh, ARM coming out of that community. And then just the very latest one, something which took everyone by surprise. Everyone heard of Raspberry Pi? Yeah. Intended to make a few hundred in their back bedroom to improve sort of uh, computer uh, literacy in, uh, in programming in uh, school students coming to university. The, the day it was launched, the websites of two of the biggest uh, electronics retailers in the UK crashed with a million hits a minute of people interested in looking at it. So on the bottom, Crick and Watson and DNA went through Selexa, which came out of uh, the chemistry side of the university, who's, who worked out how you could actually quickly sequence the genome. And that Selexa was then acquired for a lot of money by a company called Illumina, it's still active here, who basically make all the gene sequencing equipment in the world today. And that's gone on then from there to, uh, to our latest uh, company, which was also just acquired by Illumina, which is Blue Gnome, which is into, particularly into fertility uh, screening. So we've got this sort of, this wonderful triangle that's, uh, that's built up, that's sort of at the bottom, we've got 89 Nobel Prizes, more than anywhere else in the world, uh, more than many countries in the world, with these, these real stars of, um, who underpin it with the science, from Whittle, Turing, Darwin, Watson and Crick, Babbage, Rutherford, Sanger. What most people don't realise is that around the university, from that has come what's called the Cambridge Cluster, and that's about 1,500 companies, it employs 54,000 people in a town of 120,000 people. So that's pretty significant. We reckon about half of them are probably graduates of the university in those companies. And that turns over 13 billion pounds a year. It's a lot of money. And that's all just around here. And it's all from the university's fingerprints are all over it. We've had 10 of those companies go on to be billion dollar companies. And until today, we had uh, two of them were $10 billion companies. A little question over one of them, but we'll keep it on the slide for now, depending on how the news for today plays out. But we've had these two $10 billion companies. And I think that is a side of the university which most people don't appreciate. And that's the wonderful world in which we all get an opportunity to play. So building as well, in remembering <clears throat> that we're building on the shoulders of these giants that have come before us, that we've been able to build these amazing technology companies. So I'm just going to do a bit of an introduction, it's very short, on who Cambridge Enterprise is. So we're the commercialization office of the University of Cambridge. We're a limited company. We're 100% owned by the university. We are the university. And in that, we are here to support the university's mission statement. So um, what I always try to emphasize when I'm talking to people is in our mission statement, the order in which we state things. And we say we're here to help you to make your ideas and concepts more commercially successful for the benefit of society, the UK economy, the inventors, and the university in that order. So it's, again, backing up what the university's mission statement is, which is benefiting society. And we do work on things at Cambridge Enterprise where we're not making any commercial financial return. But it's things out there that are helping to save lives. And we think that's more important, that it's out there for use by society than for us to be thinking about making a royalty return. The UK economy next because they are helping to fund this university. So we want to help produce more companies, more jobs, more products, so that they think highly of the university so they keep on helping to fund us. The inventors next, we're very generous with what we provide back as, um, to the inventors and the university last. But if we do all those things, those three things first well, the university benefits in many, many different ways. We're made up of three different divisions, the technology transfer side, which does the patents and the licensing, the consultancy services, which provides um, consultancy contract, uh, negotiations and help for the uh, administration, for the academics, and the seed funds. And um, this hopefully should pique your interest. The next slide. 
So we've been able to see in our portfolio companies over a billion pounds of further funding, which is amazing for a university to make this kind of achievement. We're very proud of the portfolio we have and what they've been able to achieve. And we know that there's, because of the success of what we've been able to achieve, we are able to attract even more funding in. So this is really to talk about the difference between market pull and technology push. And I have to choose my words very carefully when I'm talking about this one. It's easy to sort of be misunderstood. Everyone's familiar with the uh, little blue pill on the, on the left-hand side. Maybe some are more familiar with it than others. <laughs> but this is a failed drug. Viagra was actually uh, developed as a heart drug to widen the coronary arteries and improve the uh, blood supply to people who had coronary artery disease. And they put it out in clinical trials. And it did absolutely nothing for their hearts. Not, not in the conventional way, anyway. But what they, what they found was suddenly the people who were on the clinical trials were phoning up and saying, can we get some more of these drugs? <laughs> They're fantastic. Uh, and that was sort of, when that started to come in, that was when Pfizer, and it was Pfizer down at Sandwich in Kent here where this was all developed, they started to realise that maybe there was something, there was a market demand that they had never realised for a product which they had developed, which was failing in its primary purpose. So you have to always keep your mind open that sort of what you actually think your product is for may not be where it actually ends up. So this hope, is a really good example of yeah, it. So we hope this is a good example of um, customer pull. Yeah. Next one. Glad you said that. <laughs> the other side, we've got the telephone. Alexandra Graham Bell who came up with this idea, and I've got a wonderful quote from a, a presentation he gave to uh, investors in Philadelphia, where one of the investors said to him, surely, Mr. Bell, you don't expect us to believe you're going to wire up every house in this country. And I think today he was correct, but it was, it was something nobody knew they needed until he came along with it. He was pushing it. He had a technology and he had to get people to buy into it, and that's, that's a slow process of, of getting it in a new technology into a market. But I think it's, it's interesting when you look at it from the position of a university here, that what we tend to create is technologies in a university. And I'll, I'll widen that out a little bit, because what we work with is not just the... the and if you're from the arts and humanities and social sciences, we're working here in this university with people from places as diverse as divinity and education and psychology. So this is not just technologies, but generally we tend to create technologies, and people don't buy technologies. They buy products and services. So in these products, um, my first uh, iPod had a little magnetic uh, disk drive in it, a one-inch diameter magnetic disk drive. Nowadays, it's got a solid-state silicon memory. As far as the, that's a big change in technology, a big advance in technology. As far as the customers are concerned, it's an iPod. They have no clue that what's gone on inside has changed. So the technologies are often enabling, but it's not what the people go out and buy. So the first example that we're going to bring to you this evening is to do with customer pull. So here is the problem. How do you test lung function on a child who is unconscious? Maybe some of you have thought about this. Maybe some of you have not even <coughs> thought about the fact that this could prove a difficulty. And there was somebody who was actually thinking about this who is located at Addenbrooke's. And he had a distinct problem because he deals with children. And uh, if they're not well, if they're unconscious, you cannot properly test lungs. So he wanted to find a solution. And there was somebody that he knew that knew about technology. And so he had a word. And this person that he spoke to, very wisely chosen, happened to be very well networked in Cambridge and knew a few people. So he sort of having heard from the respirologist at Addenbrooke's what the problem was, and they were sitting chatting about it, this person said, I think I know somebody I could go to in the university who might have an idea who we could speak with. 
And so he came to, in fact, the Department of Engineering, where we're sitting at the moment, and spoke to Philip Guilford, who is Director of Research here for the Engineering. And Philip said, yes, actually, we do have some people inside the department that's working on the technology that you might find interesting and that might just be able to solve the problem. And that led to Dr. Joan Lazenby, who's here in the department. And she happened to be working on something that's completely unrelated to medic, to the medical world. She was working on gaming. But it just happened to be that what she was working on in gaming was very appropriate for solving this problem. So she was able to provide the algorithm. And the algorithm allows for non-invasive. You don't, there's no touching of the person. Because in gaming, again, it is remote. You're not having to touch. Well, that's fine. The algorithm part has been solved. So the next part was the hardware. Well, it happened to be that the, this person who I will be mentioning later, he also happened to know somebody else in town because, you know, you've got the algorithm, but he just needs something to go around it. And he happened to do some glide flying with somebody who um, was worked for Plextex, which is one of our consultancy firms in Cambridge. And we are very blessed in Cambridge on having a, a host of fantastic consultancy firms who are very good at design, very good at thinking through solutions. And so they went to Plextech and they provided the design. And then it needed to be tested. So it go, went back to the respirologist in Edinburgh, who is Dr. Richard Isles, whose problem he had perceived in the first place. And he says, yeah, he is very, very keen to do the clinical testing of this. The result of this was that in 2009, they created a company based on the clinical need for better lung function assessment in children. So what the business person out of this who, who um, was putting it all together, what he actually did is he did what I would hope most of you would do is he actually asked the respirologist, he said the question, so how many more people are there like you that face this similar problem? And the answer was, well, Addenbrooks, we do 10,000 tests a year. We represent 10% of all the tests that are done in a year in the UK which is, represents 5% of all the tests in the world, at which point the business person said, that's good enough. There's a market. But I just want to go back to Darwin and standing on the shoulders of giants. I'm not going to bring in philosophy. So sometimes the best ideas are the most obvious ones, because you look at that now and you go, well, that's obviously a good solution is to have it portable because then you can get to all the people that you wouldn't normally have been able to test. And that's sometimes where the best ideas come from. And in doing that, you have to remember one thing. This is where, for those of you who sort of uh, want to take a deep breath, I'm using Wittgenstein. This is Cambridge for you. <laughs> <laughs> Another one of our alumni, Wittgenstein, um, who he died in 1952, 53, um, here in Cambridge. And it is one of the things that he said that um, I, I just wanted to bring this evening, which basically he was saying in this, this uh, treatise that he is writing, that as you climb up things and you get more knowledge, at some point on that ladder, everything becomes more obvious. And what you have to do is throw away that ladder, because now you're at a different plane. In a way, if you think about the giants that have come before us and their discoveries, you take for granted the iPad. It didn't exist three years ago. We're on a completely new plane. We've had to throw away all that old technology. We're on a new <coughs> technology plane. And it's at this point that you guys sitting in this room, it's not just the iPad, there's other inventions as well and all the life science, is that you now have to climb the next ladder up. And when you get to that next level, it's going to be obvious and again, you're going to have to throw that ladder away. That's Wittgenstein's ladder. At this I, I think it's important that you will see things that we can't yeah. see. Yeah. So most of you here will get Twitter and Facebook and all the social media in a way that sort of Shirley and myself probably never will, shy, <laughs> etc. So people coming through, the, the, the new generation coming through, see the world in a different way and uh, in ways that we can't see it. And that's important that you actually... Uh, follow that uh, that direction. 
and don't be constrained by looking out the back window, driving a car by looking out the back window at what everyone else has done before you. Create new ways of doing things which people haven't thought of before. So uh, I would like to bring you to a couple of challenges. So I'm going to introduce you to two different technologies with similarity, say, and what, it, what we call uh, platform technologies. So I want you to understand what kind of challenge we face when someone comes to you with something that you feel is super interesting, is, is super cool, but you don't have someone yet that's going to tell you, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to spend money on it. So this is a, a technology, Polymeropolis, and probably the best way to introduce you to this technology is if you can click on the link, the YouTube one, so you can actually see what happened. So we sit in a room, someone from the university comes to you and does that. So it's basically stretching a piece of material and it's changing color in a, in a, in a, with a certain vibrant color that wouldn't be able before and it's also showing a pattern underneath. So I probably did the same face you're doing now, open my mouth and the, Awesome. What do, I, what do I do with it now? And this is the question I wish to ask you. And I think that's where the interactive part starts with this technology and we move to the next one. But what do you do to, with it? What market? What should you do? Who should you approach? What you should think of? First of all, this is still an ongoing project as the next one. So I don't actually have a successful answer to share with you such as we sell billions and there is a company and uh, you know, everyone is a millionaire. I don't have that. But what I can share with you is the challenges we faced so far. And the first challenge we face is everyone likes it, no one knows what to do with it. <laughs> so we, are, we engage with fashion designers, they play around with it, they loved it. Is the difficulties in actually dealing with the material itself, because you need to coat an existing material. Therefore, when you go in fashion, you need to, to have it tailored to your body in a particular way in the terms of you know, the wave, the, the, wish, the designer wish the material, the dress to have, and things like that. So we are still engaging with this designer further, and we hope that you know, there will be interest there. But you know, that's kind of, it took several months in order for us to, first of all, pass the message across correctly to someone that doesn't have to deal with technology every day, understand what they actually try to tell you, what the problems are, and what they wish to use it for, and then try to build on that and develop it try to match that needs. One more example, yeah. Um, swimsuit applies the same in terms of brand recognition. You love to have a Nike swimsuit that is colorful. And the same is, who cares, right? So they already, they already have a big brands are probably not the best one you should approach for those kind of new products. So sometimes when you look at the market, the best, the leader in the market is probably not the one you should be speaking to for two reasons. For probably if he's a leader in the market for one product, it's because that product is selling really well. So they probably don't want anything else. This is, is gonna face similar challenges and then we go through the summary and the end of it. But uh, this is the one, I probably didn't do the face like that due to my physics background, so I understood it. I, I give you some hint on potential application, but I would like you to think of differently. So this is a nanoporous structure. So it's a structure that looks like the novel membrane, they need a support or can be used as a template. And the fact that all the pores are, intercon are interconnected between them, but it's not a direct hole. Okay, so someone comes to you and says, okay, Andrea, I've been working on this technology for about a few years, and I know that I can make these technologies in about 10 minutes, and people have been trying for the past 20 years and it takes them a month. So there must be something interesting there. It must be a need of producing this in a quick and cheap way that hasn't been done before. So my question here would be similar to the previous one. What would you do? Sit back and think. Understand what they need to see from something new in that market in order to be convinced that what you have is of interest to them. Once you understood that, you sit back and you try to develop it. With the academics, with you need full funding, you need, for, you need to try to build what is called a proof of concept. Proof of concept. So you go there, build a prototype. At that, at that time, you can start understanding what are the challenges from this idea to actually a product. 
And then you can compare yourself and benchmark yourself with what's out there. You can make filters, you can make everything you want, but unless you prove you are better and cheaper, whatever is needed, to address the problem of someone compared with other technologies, no one is going to really care much. So I guess once you have done that, you still keep in touch with the companies, try to keep them involved in the process as much as you can. So you need to, still, to build partners. You need to build someone with you that believes and has your same visions, or you have the same visions that they have. And then you keep your finger crossed. They might like it, they might have the money, they might be interested in, in uh, investing in your technology for further development, or you might find the money to open a new company. But what I, what I think I need to highlight here is, you know, I pick actually, last sentence I pick it from a meeting I had with Tony two days ago. They said, just don't stand still, do something. It's always better to do something than doing nothing. In the worst case, you do something wrong, doesn't matter. You learn from it, and you're not going to do it next time, and you're going you're gonna to learn from your product, you're going to do something. So if you want to understand market needs, from, our, from my personal experiences, listen to people, ask the right questions, and do something. It's, that is pointless to stand in front of the computer at Google and look at nice picture of CEOs if you don't speak with them. So I think that's pretty much what I want. I don't know if you want to add anything. I pinch your crazy so. <laughs> no, no, Yeah, microphone's off. Switch it on. It's said that most companies don't succeed in the markets they set out to address. So there's two things of this. One is just set out and do something. Remember that Apple really took off. It was selling to home hobbyists until it was at, a, at an exhibition. And in off the street walked an accountant who had a thing called VisiCalc. And VisiCalc was the first electronic spreadsheet that allowed the accountants to run spreadsheets and change numbers and it all rippled through. That's what actually made Apple that chance encounter of someone walking in off a street to an exhibition. If he, if he'd still been sat in his room thinking, what do I do with this computer, that would never have happened. So one thing is, is to recognise that uh, you may end up in markets you didn't set out to address, but actually doing something gets you, helps to get you there. Secondly is keeping an open mind to new ideas. Don't be fixed. We started, so we've got to finish on this. And, uh, and always keep your mind open for new opportunities. Twitter came out of a company that was failing in its product and they said okay we've got some venture capital money left we're not going to raise more on what we're doing now what are we going to do and they sat down for two days and out of it one of their engineers said i got this idea of something called twitter and the rest is history <laughs> but it was it was their openness to say that uh, we what we're doing is wrong let's let's look at what else we can do and change direction which was important for their survival and that's so important in this get on and do something but stay open to to what the right thing you should have been doing is when it reveals itself. And that takes me on to the two last slides. And if you think you have an idea or you have an idea, Cambridge Enterprise, we're very happy to hear from you. It's not that you need to have an idea that's going to be patented. You might have an idea that isn't <coughs> going to be patented, but it still could be commercialized and you're not sure. So we're there to help you think it through so please don't hesitate to be in touch if you have an idea or you think you have an idea. And we hopefully can help you work through what is the best route for commercialization. And I'm going to leave the last word to Tony, and then we're going to take a few questions. Tony, <coughs> last word. Last word. So there we are, back at, uh, back at Cambridge University. Uh, in 800 years, it has changed a lot of history, and it is those people that have have sort of walked in off the street or suddenly sort of had a, had a realisation that they have something that have made that happen. Um, as I said at the beginning, this is one of the most exciting jobs in the best jobs in the world because we get all this stuff walks in off the street and a lot of the time you're thinking, as Andrea has uh, said, this is fascinating. It's got to be useful for something. I haven't a clue what it is, but we work on it. And uh, you are the people that are going to be coming those forward with those ideas. A lot of you are working in the research labs here. Keep your eyes open for an opportunity. Cambridge really is a place where if you can, if you can spot an opportunity, we can help you make your future with it. And uh, the door is open to you.